The Clean Power Hour is brought to you by Continental Energy Solutions. I'm Tim Montague, your co-host. Today on the Clean Power Hour, Ford launches their electric F-150 pickup truck. We're going to talk about that. Community Solar Tracker by ILSR, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, has created a website to track community solar. I'm excited to give it a brief review. And in related to that, I learned about that from my new favorite podcast, which is Freeing Energy by Bill Nussie. Hope to have him on the uh, solar podcast one of these days soon. And we're going to talk about one of John's projects at Whaling City Solar. Uh Oh, and there's an EV tax credit coming. So that's a good good news in EVs and clean energy. Welcome to the show, my co-host, John Weaver, commercial solar guy. Tim, Tim, how you doing? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm really interested in uh, all the EV stuff I'm seeing these days. And so I found it funny that when I brought up the cool new F-150, you were, uh, you had some opinions to express there, Timothy. I feel very uh, strongly. I feel very strongly about all right. <laughs> about EVs. Now that I'm an EV owner, and uh -huh. and we share that, and we share the trials and tribulations. If you are driving more than 300 miles in a long range Model Y, you cannot do that without stopping to charge. Bottom line, right? And it said the computer will tell you, oh, you can go 300 miles, Mr. Tesla Model Y owner, but guess what? You cannot go 300 miles. You can go maybe 275 miles. So Ford is saying their lower end version of the Lightning, which I love the name and I love the F-150 and I'm thrilled that Ford is getting in the game, but a car that's gonna go less than 300 miles on a tank, so to speak, is, gonna make a lot of consumers unhappy if they if they actually own it now so i don't know how the ev industry has arrived at 300 as the magic number i think 400 is a good number of actual range that's what i long for now that i've been driving my ev for six months but what do you think and why why do you think the uh, ford is a good is a good product um, the thing I liked about that it got the most attention for me when I saw the launch, launch and why I grabbed the link to Sunrun is the integration of Sunrun plus Ford and that they're setting it up with at least three plugs. And I, got, I found some pictures on Reddit and there's at least three plugs that you can plug in two, uh, was it 3.6 kW, 20, um, 20 amp plugs and one. 7.4 uh, 30 amp and you can run a lot of stuff off that and it's specifically talked about an 80 amp charging stand that Sunrun is going to install and so all of that together was really interesting because of the integration of vehicle to grid vehicle to house whatever it's going to be and there's a lot of people that have electricity going off in these longer uh, power lines that have a lower density population around them so across the entire midwest I don't know this for a fact because I don't know the utility numbers that well, but I, I, I guess that farther from the power stations, farther out on the grid, you're going to have more grid outages. That's just the nature of the machine. And if that's the case, then the entire Midwest that really loves the F-150 is now going to get a chance at a decently priced whole house backup. Uh, I'm told that, you know, 80 amps isn't going to cover the whole house because, you know, a lot of houses have a 200 amp panel, but 80 amps is going to cover enough if you are you know, if you take the time to install a proper panel and, you know, have the Sunrun installation, maybe reach out to the- well, Let's talk uh, kilowatt hours because that's a, that's a figure that consumers understand. And, okay. you know, the average home uses 10 kilowatt hours per day. You need a 30 kilowatt hour battery and a solar array if you want to operate off grid. And so I'm thrilled about vehicle to grid. Great. I've got a 75 kWh battery or- yeah, 75 kWh battery in the Tesla, right? And so that does give me some days of... Truck batteries, bigger. Well, yeah, it has to be. It's a, it's, a big, it's a big, heavy machine uh, with greater towing capacity. Um, but How do you like it as a truck? Based on, like, do you... I never use a truck. Um uh, as a as a, a stat machine looking at uh, the product line and its usability, 
you know, it's the small one. I know it's not the 350 or anything, but as a truck, is it a solid machine? The basic stats? Yeah, it's a good truck. And that's why it's one of the most popular trucks in the market, right? The F-150 is, is a beautiful truck. And it's only getting better in the EV version because now it has this ginormous frunk, right? The front trunk. Have you, uh, <laughs> have you seen how it's different from the Tesla one? Like the Tesla one, you lift a hood up and so you, you reach down in the trunk. It's a, it's a tub. Whereas yeah. the truck, and I, again, we should check out these pictures, but whereas the truck, you flip up the whole hood and you can just slide stuff into it. So I'm, I'm guessing somebody's like, you can just put like huge volumes. I mean, I bet you the frunk is, it, it's just a gigantic, yeah, right there. Um, it, and uh, I bet you the frunk just has a huge number of uh, uh, amount of space in there. I was just really surprised when I saw these images. I was like, whoo. Uh, so let's see, show images. We got uh, you got to click the show images button at the top. There's more. The show images button. I oh. don't oh. know what you're talking about. Uh, well, let's see if I can uh, get you the link directly to that one, which shows the frunk. <clears throat> there's one of seven images. Uh, maybe you can just scroll to the right. Maybe it's at the top. I am. You don't see the frunk on screen? Oh, oh, there you go. You found it. See, I'm, I was looking at my own screen. That's it. I want to show that it's different. It's really big. Um, oh, and you yeah, can see the plugs here too. It's like a mini bed. You could probably, you, know, you could put chairs in there and turn that into like your. Uh, yeah, no, um, I mean a truck bed. It's it just it's more of a truck bed than a than a frunk. But but okay. anyway. This is all good. I just think that we're kidding ourselves about the range of EVs and what consumers really want. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be an early adopter. I'm happy to stop and charge for 50 minutes when I have to do a 300 mile trip. And, but, but the network of chargers has to be there. And okay, this isn't gonna come out until 2022. Uh, and, and, you know, I know that people are stepping on the gas on the charging networks. I'm just, uh, you know, we're going to need a whole lot of chargers. Um, and uh, so I, I'm just, I'm very curious. I think the price point is wonderful. It's actually cheaper than the, the ICE engine version, which is amazing. And, you know, I don't know how they did that. But uh What's interesting I, else is that there's a new tax credit being submitted to the government. Uh, have you seen that one? I just saw it this morning on uh, electric. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard whispers of this and, but what, what are the details on the tax credit? So uh, there's three chunks. There's a uh, union made in the U S there's made in the U S and there's outside of the U S uh, so, and it removes the cap. So right prior, there was a $200,000 uh, per manufacturer cap. I thought it was 400, but I guess it was 200. And so, uh, so it's been raised or even gotten rid of until the, U until the U.S. vehicle fleet hits 50% EVs. So, you know, forever. Um, and so it's $7,500 incentive for any electric car. If it's produced in the U.S., it's 10 grand. If it's produced by Union, it's 12 and a half. So first off, it's probably written specifically to bump Tesla a little bit, uh, but maybe that's okay. I don't know. I, I think it's amusing, whatever. It's up there, it's being talked about. Uh, it's interesting that Ford has come out with its big announcements and that there's other, you know, there's a factory being built in Georgia, which is the Ford stuff. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Sunrun is pushing this, I'm sure in their side because Sunrun is partnering with Ford to make this 80 amp charging station. It's uh, really interesting watching Sunrun. They're so smart. Uh, you know, they, they're just, they just do so much. I, I never thought the leasing model for residential would stay around forever, but it, uh, but they have. And Sunrun is doing things that are different and smarter. And it's like, wow, it's just cool just to watch. Give us some, give us some meat on the bones though, on the, uh, on the Sunrun. I had the electric story up 
I think we, I think you did a good job summarizing that it's, you know, we've, <laughs> we haven't had one for Tesla because of the volume, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but, but anyway, so up to $12,500 could be coming depending on the brand car. Uh, and that's how the EV, now I remember, that's how the EV gets cheaper. The EV Ford gets cheaper than the ICE engine Ford is with the tax credit. Ah, cool. Um, but uh, is Sunrun going after a charger for residents or for commercial facilities? Because that's a big okay. difference. And I'm just curious. So somewhere, so as was announced, was that Ford Intelligent Backup Power was launched with the truck. And I don't have the hard details on it, but I'm looking at the press release here from Sunrun. And it just specifically references the 80 amp charge station and home integration system. I don't know what it's gonna be, but the talk is of course, is that's just a backup, it's part of your house. It's interesting that Sunrun, the nation's largest residential solar installation company is gonna partner with Ford to help get into people's houses and yeah. install a car charger with a battery. Now, now Tom, t Tim, I got so excited with this. I called you somebody else's name. That was close though. Tim, if you were a person who just bought an F-150, a giant battery, you have this home integration kit, you have this charge station pro, and you have this company installing it for Ford. And they say, hey dude, um, if you let us install a solar system that you pay no money down on, uh, we'll knock off 20 bucks a month off your bill. You just pay us the electricity. What would you, would you take a free solar system? Would I take a free solar system? I would, take a, I would take a free solar system, but nothing is free, dude, come on. Of course, you're selling your roof. Would you trade, or at least put it this way, how many people do you think are gonna be like, yeah, I'll trade you some of my roof, or nah, I'll just build it myself. I bet there's a huge percentage of Ford F-150 Lightning owners who go solar. And if that happens, I think this is the coolest truck on the market. Because if it pulls people to solar power, like other EVs do, but if this pulls people to solar power more because of the way Sunrun and this backup and all that vehicle to house integration is going on, uh, I think that this, I think the secondary thing makes this vehicle even cooler, the way this is being packaged. And I, uh, and that's what excites me about it is that little packaging Sunrun, the backup system, 80 amp, and the, all the solar that's going to get pitched. That's, that's a home run. Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a 50 amp charger in my garage. And if you own an EV, you absolutely want a 50 amp charger installed. It costs 400 to $500. And, and then you have peace of mind. It charges the vehicle in 10 hours. And, uh, and so you can, you can arrive home with almost no battery left and then go somewhere in the morning. And that's a good thing. So if you can then combine that with solar and uh, increase the amperage to 80 amps, that's wonderful, right? More amps is better when it comes to charging. We, we need fast charging. And that when I talk about charging infrastructure, I'm not talking about destination chargers that are 50 amp chargers. I'm talking about these 250 or 300 kilowatt chargers, the, the Tesla charging network, and which is why I own a Tesla, right? There just isn't a robust fast charging network for, um, for other EVs, in my opinion. Now, I, I could be ignorant of that. Maybe it is robust, as, as robust as Tesla, but... Um, but it's so. yeah and but so anyway so that's all that's all good and i i just don't know i i need to i need to study the sunrun model is it in the midwest see we have very cheap power we have uh consumers have nine cent power and and maybe seven cent power and so can sunrun offer me a solar lease that's going to reduce my power bill i don't know there's a lot of states Sunrun is not in, and if we really wanted to, but we're not going to. Well, they're um, in Illinois. Um, oh, then yes. Then yes, they in, can. They're in northern Illinois anyway. I oh, don't know if they're then, in central Illinois yet, but 
they're yeah. in the Chicago, they're in the Chicago area. Well, and, they, they know their markets. They are among the best. They probably know every single zip code in the nation. So there's a few things, and this is a good segue, I guess. Uh, I, don't, I don't have anything to share on screen about this, but you know, we have uh, new energy legislation in the works here in Illinois. The challenge with solar in Illinois is that the RECs, the renewable energy credits, this is a cash incentive to homeowners and business owners and community solar developers. Those RECs are dried up right now. So we're in a holding pattern for new, new projects. You can still put a project in the queue, but you can't get the, the cash until it gets an award and it's TBD when that could happen. So tomorrow, Friday, May 28th, the Illinois State Legislature is voting on the governor's omnibus energy bill, which is gonna do a few key things if it passes or when it passes. If it doesn't pass now, then it gets kicked down till November of 2021. It's going to give us the things that I'm excited about 100% RPS. Okay, we have a 25% RPS. It's going to give us five megawatt AC community solar projects. Today we have two megawatt AC. So bigger community solar projects. That's just more efficient, and and uh, it just makes a whole lot of sense. And many other markets have gone to that kind of five megawatt mark. Um, but and then, of course, it's going to reignite the DG space for, you know, it's going to make the money flow for residential and commercial renewable energy credits so that you can truly benefit from solar, whether you want to own it or you want to buy into community solar. Um, and we are going to talk about community solar with the ILSR uh, project, so to speak. So cross your fingers that we get this new legislation in Illinois and then and then it's go time again. I was uh, completely asleep at the wheel though, John, in the intro, and I forgot to mention that the, soul, that the Clean Power Hour is now available as an audio only podcast. So check us out on your favorite platform, Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, and several others like Stitcher, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio. You can find most of the Clean Power Hour episodes, I don't have all of the backlog done yet, but um, but we're up to date there now. So check that out. And uh, if you're on Apple, please rate and review. That makes a huge difference if you can give us a star rating and a review. So that helps other people find it. And there's so much, you know, there's so much awesome information available on this podcast and many, many others now. Uh, it's a it's a growing cadre of clean energy podcasts that are out there, but check it out. So where are we in the uh, in the roster, John? What do you want to talk about next? Well, the ILSR, um, I like them. I follow them. I don't get too deep into their stuff. They put out a lot of great content, and and I know they. I really like their philosophy though, the local stuff. So whenever I see them, I always try to read it. But they they put out a lot of stuff. There's two or three people that share a lot, and. Uh, but I was wondering uh, what do you like about this? Cause this is actually a story that you found. So I'm always interested in hearing uh, your stuff, uh, especially yeah. about the Illinois stuff. The Illinois is interesting. Yeah, you know, there's some really good things happening in the Midwest. Minnesota got in the community solar game in like 2015 and it really took off in 2017. And, uh, but I discovered this this page that ILSR has created or this program, it's called State Community Solar Programs. Um, well, this is a graph of state community solar programs. What is the program called? National Community Solar Programs Tracker. So ILSR is based in Twin Cities, Minnesota, and they're well known for a whole variety of things around the environment, health, jobs, justice, and, and basically creating a world that's better for humanity, right? And uh, so, but I found out about this from Bill Nussie's podcast called Freeing Energy, and I'm going to that page now. So check out freeingenergy.com. And Bill Nussie is a seasoned entrepreneur and CEO who is now in the clean energy space. <clears throat> he was a software entrepreneur whose company got bought by IBM and uh and he's doing amazing work in the developing world with freeing energy. Um, and you see some of the topics here that he specializes in microgrids and um, 
grid vulnerability, investing in energy, and he targets Africa especially. So he's interested in bringing clean energy to those billion people that don't have electricity at all, right? And, and that's why solar and storage is so important, John, is because with a little solar array and a little battery, you can truly have lights and power to charge your cell phone and be connected to the internet and get education and access to so many things, right? That, that empowers people, uh, just the educational opportunities alone, right? Through all the MOOCs and YouTube, et cetera, right? Um, but so back to the ILSR page here. Oh, and, and Freeing Energy, they host a weekly podcast uh, that Bill Nussie is the host of. So check that out. It's a, it's a wonderful podcast by the same name, Freeing Energy. So, but, but like so many things, John, I have a beef with this website too. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a good beef. Uh, nobody's perfect, right? <clears throat> but you see this graph here, Colorado, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and New York. Okay. Those are some of the most often referenced states with, re with regard to community solar. But where's Illinois? Like, come on. Where's New York? Well, New York's right there. <laughs> yeah, New York's there. But, um, and, and where's New Jersey? New Jersey has a program. Maryland has a program. It references these programs like Illinois as being under development. Well, no, Illinois is mostly constructed. 111 community solar projects are mostly constructed and many of them are fully interconnected and operational now. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's gotta be in the dozens that are fully operational because literally the, it's, it's this summer and we're done. Construction is going to be done this year on, on those 111 community solar projects. So I think they, they need to shine a light, a brighter light on Illinois, please, ILSR. But, um, but it's, yeah, it's interesting that Minnesota now has 800 megawatts AC of community solar and uh, New York and Massachusetts are, are chasing them. Where, where are New York and Massachusetts going, do you think, in terms of the scale of those community solar programs? Because New York State has a ton of construction going on. Yeah, there's, there's a lot, and there's a lot more coming. The New York numbers should double, probably completing. If I just watch these press releases about people developing there, uh, you know, Pennsylvania's going to come. Uh, Virginia's going to come. Uh, there's going to be other states as well that will hit soon. Uh, some states have signed legislation, some are pending, like Pennsylvania is pending, Virginia has signed something. So there's, there's going to be other states coming soon too. Uh, I bet you North Carolina does something a little bigger, a little different. We'll see. Um, but, you know, New York's coming and there's a lot of volume. I bet you it doubles. I bet you it catches up to uh, Minnesota. Uh, there's some slowdowns right now as they figure some stuff out. But, you know, they got another decade. They got another five years, seven years of just building stuff figuring it out. It's going to come. Ma Massachusetts, it's got its smart prob program, which has its problems, which is funny. Uh, it's, um, it's just, a, it's a build and it, it'll keep growing. The Massachusetts volume will keep growing. It's a, it's a weird market. There's a lot less community solar and just, uh, um, you know, trading off some incentives. I don't know. It doesn't feel like a very pure community solar. Like I have solar technically, just some guy called me and said, hey, do you want to switch your account? And I was like, okay. And I don't know. It doesn't feel, there's no pureness to it. I feel so, uh, I feel like I'm being pimped out for a couple of pennies. And that's about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we have, we have <clears throat> in, in the city I live in, community choice aggregation where a bunch of cities in Illinois have come together and done a bulk purchase of all uh, wind and solar energy, mostly wind energy. And so my house is technically powered by renewable energy, even though I don't have solar on my roof. But um, the other cool thing about the ILSR work is this map here, which they're mapping communities that are quote unquote, taking charge of their energy futures. So it's not, this map is not representative of necessarily quantities of solar and clean energy, but it's representative of states that have good legislation for local energy. And that's kind of the difference, right, between New York and Florida. There's a ton of solar in Florida, but it's mostly large scale utility scale or large scale community solar that the utility owns. 
they don't have good incentives for DG, even though Florida is one of the best states for sunshine. Um, yeah, everything in Florida is utility scaled. I mean, they, they're, they're trying to inch schools forward to be able to buy solar from third parties. They've, they've sort of allowed residential leasing to go on, but no, nothing bigger. You know, a few years ago, some people tried to do a, a two megawatt over the fence solar model, uh, which could be linked to third parties. Uh, Next era, FPL, they're doing a good job of holding on to the, uh, the cash down in Florida for electricity generation. No. So Florida is going to be a slow one. It's going to come. They, they, there's all these different states experimenting with models. You know, the south, southeast just seems to hold on with more utility scale power. Uh, it's, it's, it comes down to the politics. Um, you know, it's the nature of, uh, nature of what we live in, dude. Uh, but there's a lot of community solar coming. I'm hoping to do some of it my own self. Uh, you know, we have a, we have a few, um, documents submitted in New York. We have a few submitted in Pennsylvania and hopefully we represent, I don't know, we're, we're, we're open to do some stuff. So I'll tell you, as I learn when, uh, when some interconnections occur. Yep. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very strange thing that utilities are there for us, right. To provide a service to consumers, but they have a lot of power and that is the challenge of these monopolies, even though they're regulated, they dance to their own tune. And the point that, that Bill makes on the podcast, which is wonderful on, on the freeing energy podcast, they, they do several interviews about this is there's a disconnect between what consumers want and what utilities want. And, the utilities somehow forget that they really need to increase the frequency of that feedback loop so that they're in real time developing a future that consumers want. And I'm not sure what the various PUCs need to do to, you know, change that, but it's, uh, it's a pretty significant disconnect in the United States. There's 50 different uh, energy futures, right? And as we can see by that map that IS, ILSR built, there's 50 different uh, good, bad, ugly when it comes to local clean energy access. And uh, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna clean the grid and have a sustainable future, we need all of those states to be lit up green um that's the bottom line right <clears throat> yep there, there, there's a lot of all you know what and this next story kind of touches on that big versus little kind of a, a tiny bit um yeah and you know fighting the utilities that's a whole other story i mean we could write books on that dude we could have a podcast on it there's a website i you might be familiar with it uh energy and policy or something and I follow them on Twitter very closely. And uh, they are always paying attention to utility malfeasance, uh, things going on. And it's like constant. It's constant across the U.S. Uh, you know, what was a, that reference you just gave? Malfeasance? No, the, the, what is covering the utility space? Oh, it's energy and policy. I should find it, right? I can't bring it up and not like talk about the website. Okay, let's see if I can find it. Let's see how I do. Okay, so there's Daniel. Let's see if Daniel Tate actually works for them. Uh, oh, man. This, I know he's going to share it. I know he'll share it. So let's, let's see if I can find the site. Um, well, no, I'm they gonna just, put your, I'm going to put your PV Magazine story on, on, on the screen. Uh, enough solar and wind to clean the U.S. power grid available yesterday. <laughs> so this is... This is uh, this is resonant of last week's show, I think, right? <clears throat> but you've got a new story in PV Magazine. Congratulations. And I love it that you are uh, writing for them again. And it gives you so much street cred, John. I really actually, the, the best thing about writing for PV Mag is that I have to learn enough 
and teach enough to show off to smart people. And that's tough. You got to like know some things. You have to read the document. You got to go beyond the press release. And when you go to that press release, uh, it's like the press release is cool. It gives you that high level, but it doesn't give you the depth, it doesn't give you the data. And so when I read those documents and I talk about them and try to say them competently, it's just, I don't know, it makes it like I have to work harder to read the article. And uh, so reading the long document is really what I think is my superpower because I don't watch TV. I sit around and read stuff. And so that's my fun. So this story, okay. Um, plus this makes me look smart and people want to call me and say, hey, can you help me with my project? Because I know about these things. And so it's, a, it's a, my sales technique. That's, that's it, dude. This is me trying to pretend I know things. Uh, so, so this is a report put out by uh, one of the US's, uh, it's the energy and something policy team that's at the Berkeley labs. And that's one of the groups that are run by the US government of the, the major research labs across the, uh, the country. So it's the uh, energy and uh, that, that, uh, energy electric markets and policy group at Berkeley lab, the EMP team. And so they track the queues across, the interconnection queues across the US. There's like 32 or 35 uh, big ones and then a whole bunch of small ones. And they say they cover about 85% of the large scale projects being applied for, for interconnection. And you know that's a, that turns out that across the US right now, there's 750 gigs of, of, of generation capacity that has been submitted for not projects that are real. Like you and me, we won't submit too many projects that don't have a high probability. Maybe during the heyday of the uh, development with uh, Illinois, there was some of that going on. Well, when that goes on, like you guys had that lottery, that's going on on the national level, but wind and solar is 650 gigs of capacity, maybe even 680, something like that. And that's utility and large stuff. That's mostly bigger than uh, five megawatts. There's some smaller projects, but the main volume was big stuff. And if we, and we know that that volume isn't going to all get installed right away because the machine isn't in place to take it. But that means we've chosen sites for 650 gigs. And I bet you that means we could, as developers, get to a terawatt like, like that. And a terawatt of capacity of wind and solar would be enough to 100% clean today's power grid. We'd probably need two terawatts for tomorrow's power grid, three terawatts for you know everybody having their own bit mining rig, 3D metal printer. You're talking about US. just the US, right? US, US, this yeah. is all US land and this is all US interconnection queues. So it was just a cool report that was put out and there's a lot of good, uh, a lot of good reason to think that we have a lot of solar and wind that we can easily, easily start deploying if the machine was ready and the machine isn't ready, the solar developers have done a lot of work already. And, uh, you know, we got to fight, dude. We got to fight for those projects because the big boys want to take them. They don't want to let the small. So within our industry, Tim, we have the next steros of the world who will beat the heck out of any legislation that supports anything smaller than 50 megawatts. Because NextEra wants to control the big stuff because they know that they dominate. They're the best at it. They have big capital. They have expertise. They have experience. They will beat the heck out of all the small stuff. That's Florida, for example. They do that across the nation, though. Um, if if, if, uh, if NextEra controls it, you and I don't install nearly as much solar. If NextEra and the big companies can be beat up, we'll widen the base and have a much more distributed solar system. So this is a this is a deep story on multiple levels. Capacity, who's going to win, who's not going to win, how much we have, uh, who's going to let it in. Uh, what it really says is that we can clean the power grid if the uh, if the animals are let loose to do what they need to do, and uh, and that's cool to see. So so that was my story. Excellent. Well, we're going to skip to projects of the week. Yep. Uh, you've got a project with Whaling City Solar that we're going to show on screen here. And <clears throat> that is one long ladder. That's a nice house too. I like the purple. It's, it's, it looks, it's got a purple blue when you're up front. I just drove over there a few minutes ago. Yeah. It's really nice looking. But that's the panels up front. Uh, 
they're just get though by the evening they'll have some panels up there they may or may not finish it's a uh, you know it's a tough angle up there you got to take your time everybody's strapped up and uh takes a takes a little bit of work to get things done um there's also we discovered that one of the yeah <laughs> I, I too felt the height of the ladder was something to consider. <laughs> uh, we discovered that one of the things that we thought was a solid piece of wood, that's the uh, connect the uh, uh, conduit coming down the other side of the house. The customer didn't want it because their electrical is in the back. They decided that's hidden from the street. So the next batch of pictures, you get to see some electric going on. Um, it's uh, we're doing REC alpha modules here, which are these are hetero junction. They're made in Singapore. I'm really kind of I like the product. It's just neat. It's a really neat product. Um, and uh, it's just hetero junction. I like hetero junction and it comes from Meyer Burger. So it was their equipment line. And uh, that's the inside of a truck. <laughs> and there's the panels, of course, the last image. So these are the at least the prior generation of Meyer Burger hetero junction alpha. This is uh, their 365 product, and it's uh, it's just cool. I, I just like uh, seeing it. That's the original, you know, stickers. Yeah, the the REC Alpha is uh, <clears throat> one of the nicest residential modules on the market. I have to say, and uh, I would would not hesitate to put REC on my own house if I had the opportunity. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see. We want to talk about cryptocurrency. <clears throat> Crypto in the news, like left and right. And, you know, most of it's thanks to uh, Elon Musk, honestly, and his fascination with Dogecoin and Bitcoin and, you know, Tesla bought what was it one and a half billion dollars of Bitcoin a couple months ago and then all of a sudden he's like oh yeah we're no longer gonna accept Bitcoin because its carbon footprint is too big and um, if you don't understand why that is it's it's not easy to understand but there's this thing called Bitcoin mining which uses computers sometimes just a data center of computers that's dedicated to Bitcoin mining or some other cryptocurrency mining. And of course that uses a lot of juice. And so now some of these players are saying, well, we're gonna, we're gonna offset our carbon footprint with green electricity, right? Well, these, yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of talk about the sources of the electricity. There's a lot of mining going on in China. China's pushing back hard against the mining there because they don't want to use the, the uh, coal. It's a waste. Uh, there's some interesting dynamics. I mean, I remember mining back in 2011 when I could do it on my standard video cards on my big computer. Now that's not the case anymore. It's, uh, it's much different. And there's like just giant buildings just full of miners. Uh, these guys are literally going to build one of the nation's largest solar power plants in order to take advantage. And they're building it in Minnesota, way north, not in Arizona, not in some weird place down south. Montana. Uh, Mo Montana, sorry. They're building it in Montana, way north of Montana. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it's like, that's interesting. It's interesting what they're doing. I, They're going to get like, I mean, if they hook up their, if they're really smart, or if they, I don't know if this can be done, but a lot of those machines run on DC. And if you start fiddling with how the electricity comes directly into the building, you can have some fun. You can chop another 20%, 10%, 5% gain in different places with uh, getting rid of certain pieces of hardware, uh, knocking out some efficiencies. You'll get a combo of CapEx savings and energy efficiency. And I bet you'd be worth the engineering time. I don't know. I've never done it. So I'm just talking hypothesis. But I, I always thought people might uh, drive trucks of Bitcoin miners to different areas of the country that happen to have overcapacity uh, or uh, solar getting cut back and like harvest unused KWHs at various power plants and uh, maybe have automated drivers, you know, Tesla robot trucks, picking them up, taking them around, plugging them in. What do you think, Tim? Do I understand this correctly that the mining, Bitcoin mining is, <clears throat> the way this works is, 
the miners are providing services to the blockchain. And in return, they're getting a few Bitcoin for providing their CPUs to the to the grid, so to speak. Is that how this works? Yeah, so there's, there's a, and I'm not 100% the best on it. I'm solid. Uh, but there's multiple services that, can, that happen concurrently. There's verification of transactions that are going on. So every time a coin is made, every time a coin is traded, uh, all that stuff has to be uh, tracked, uploaded, double checked, tracked. It's like triple 10 tracked. And then, and that moves into the blockchain. The blockchain is where all that tracking occurs. Uh, the Bitcoin is where you get paid uh, for all this tracking. And the actual tracking of the transactions, I think, is what is partially encoded into the Bitcoins. So there's a dance, and I may not be right on that last one, but there's a dance with data being created for tracking in the blockchain, data being created for actual Bitcoins, which themselves are a, a discrete digital package of equations. And so there's, there's multiple things going on. The blockchain is a really, really interesting concept. And I do think there's actually one cool thing of a type of cryptocurrency. It's not a real cryptocurrency. It's called Ripple. It's a product they make. And, uh, and that coin, it's, it's, well, it's got value now. So I, I don't know if, I, if I'll be right. But I always thought because it can be infinitely created. It's not one of these true cryptocurrencies, which is locked down and, and immutable and all, all kinds of cool stuff. It's, it's this one dude has it and it controls it on his computer. And he's just like, here's a bunch of. Uh, XRPs. And, uh, and so you take the coin and you apply one to every single KWH of solar created. And these don't use a lot of electricity. They use like a trivial amount. And you, you track every single uh, piece of clean solar generated. And that's going to be valuable for some people. I think that's kind of neat. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if we want it to work with literally so much solar being legally required. Will tracking it still be cool when we can just literally shut down the power plant from the top level? I'm not sure, but I like the way all this stuff is going. I like Bitcoin. I like the idea of digital money. Money isn't real anyway. It's a, it's a trade of success and time and some weird stuff that we humans do. So it's cool. It's cool to watch. Yep. Well, we're going to talk about two, uh, two projects that are in different stages here in the Midwest, and then we're going to wrap up because we've got to make a hard stop here. Um, utility scale solar is booming in the Midwest. And the way this takes shape is that Iowa has now energized its largest solar project. And that is known as Wapalo Solar. And it went into operation in March, 127 and a half megawatts. Uh, I think it's nine, 800 acres in Louisa County and uh, 318,000 Ryzen Energy bifacial solar panels using FTC Solar's single axis trackers. I would love to have FTC on the show. So if you or any of our listeners are connected to FTC, please reach out to me. I want to get them on. Uh, I want to learn more about that technology. Uh, they seem to be a really good uh, you know, second tier for trackers. And then Wisconsin has now approved a 150 megawatt project in Southern Wisconsin. This is not the first large utility project in Wisconsin. There's a handful of these 100 to 400 megawatt projects coming to Southern Wisconsin. Uh, this, is, this is interestingly part of Alliant Energy's recent uh, plan to transition to clean renewable energy. Uh, this project is called Onion River Solar. And they specifically mentioned that it's going to be pollinator friendly and friendly to grazing. So look forward to following that. And with that, how can our listeners reach you, John, the commercial solar guy? Google. Google is my favorite friend. Type in commercial solar guy. You will you will definitely find us. Uh, we have a cool website where I try to post some news, commercialsolarguy.com slash news. And I write for PV Magazine, the USA site. So I, I try to get stuff out there. Uh, if you're in Massachusetts or Rhode Island, we have a general contractor license that we'd love to build for you with. And uh, that's our favorite thing to do. Build some solar. That's what we do. 
Excellent. And you can find me at cesnrg.com. If you then go to the podcast page, so forward slash podcast, you find all the solar podcast content and all of the clean power hour content as well. We're doing one of these uh, clean power hours every week. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel or the podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, etc. Give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends and reach out to us. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter, TG Montague on Twitter. And we need thousands and thousands and thousands of more people to get into the clean energy industry. And uh, of course, we want people to go solar too. It's not just get into the industry, go solar, whether you're a commercial facility owner, a resident, or you want to uh, subscribe to your community solar, all of the above. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you being here with me week in, week out, and we will be back next week, hopefully with some good news on Illinois legislation. Let's grow solar call, and storage. Call your what politician. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody.